But um, so just because, you know, it's, it's followed with a round of applause or, you know, great accolades doesn't mean that it's God. Amen. And we understand that even in the Bible, the large crowds usually went against God. And so just because it's happening in church doesn't mean that it is God. So we want to make sure we understand. But the antinomian movement and all these movements are derived from upbringings, issues, trauma, different things that happened in the upbringing of people, uh, in their uh, rearing, child rearing, upbringing. This is why here at ABC, we push so hard for us to correct things, make things right, deal with issues, all of that, so that none of that stuff gets in the next generation and they'll have an opportunity to function without dysfunction. Amen. Amen? Amen. So that's kind of what we do here. That's why we do it. Um, of, you know, of course, it's sanctioned by God, but, you know, he, he, uh, the word prophesied even about the spirit and power of Elijah coming to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. So that's what, you know, that's our basis for most of the things that are said here. We want to make sure we right the wrongs that were wrong to us when they were wrong to us so that we can stop dysfunction. Because dysfunction is going to always birth dysfunctional doctrine. When a person isn't right, they're going to preach what's not right. When a person is messed up, they're going to preach messed up stuff. When a person got issues, they're going to preach issue-oriented messages. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just going to happen. So if you don't deal with yourself, it's going to leach through and corrupt people. And so we want to make sure as believers that we all are, that we are handling things the way God wants us to handle them. And we want to deal with our issues as they come. And we aren't afraid to address certain things so that we can stand up and preach the truth. And it actually help people. And it doesn't have our agenda attached to it. Right? You know, the, the, the more you open up to God and the more you let God deal with you, the less, I mean, the, how do I say this? You become less important. The more you let him in, the less of you there'll be. You know, they used to say, I decrease. Well, the Bible says, Paul said that I decrease so that you can increase. And that's how we want to be. But that decreasing is easier said than done, especially when you grew up on the rough side of the mountain. Thrown away, abused, neglected, abandoned, abandoned by your father, abandoned by whatever, raised by whoever. And so those things begin to, especially the older you get, those things will begin to come into play. You know, Bishop Logan, we did an interview a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about Abraham Lincoln. And he said Abraham Lincoln uh, was looking for a secretary of, of state, I believe, could be wrong. But back then, you know, they didn't have what we have now he was just looking for one so they brought him one and said hey this guy would make a good secretary of state for you and he looked at him and then he dismissed him and said no it's not him and that was it and so later on they came and asked him he's like man how how did you know he said when a man is 40 and past 40 you know who they are just by looking at them first let me say this uh, it's been said that Abraham Lincoln asked an assistant to go get someone that he could hire to replace another assistant. They brought him someone. Abraham Lincoln didn't <laughs> didn't ask him a question. He looked at him and said, no, he won't do. And the guy walked away and the guy said, what? Well, you didn't even ask. He said, I looked at him. He said, by the time you're 40, I can look at you and tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. By the time we're 40, we should know who we are. So it's easy for other people to identify who we are today in corporate America, politics, even in the church. You can't tell who people are. Because they don't know who they are. So by the time you're 50, you should show sure enough know who you are. Come on. <laughs> That's so deep. So you know who they are. You can't hide it past 40. 
Yeah. And around 40 and 50, those ages is when issues from your childhood start manifesting if they haven't been dealt with. You know, you kind of act them out when you're younger or whatever, but when you're older, they begin to really pick at your character because you'll begin to look at other people envying and being jealous of where they are and where you're not. And you'll hate where you are. I, I know I'm preaching. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's important for us to get these issues taken care of so that we can stop this function that we have experienced. Amen? Amen. So what are you saved from is the question that is asked tonight. Dysfunction junction. <laughs> Somebody need to get off that street. You've been living there too long. The whole neighborhood, it's time to gentrify that neighborhood and you still holding on to a house. Get off this function junction. Amen. We are all products of our upbringing, good or bad, right or wrong, or indifferent. We are the sum of the people that raised us. That's what you are. You can hate on them, you can be mad, you can be angry, you can be whatever. You're a sum of the people that raised you. That's who you are. Amen. Yeah, you are the sum of them. We were all raised by people with struggles and issues themselves. So no matter who they were, I can look at this age group. Most of y'all were raised by baby boomers. And all baby boomers have issues. Because society made sure of it. And their issue was usually they thought they were doing the right thing by trying to push you into a societal norm. They felt that was progress. They felt that was betterment for you to fulfill what society's expectations for you were and that's why so many people are in debt divorced unhappy those things because they sided with society instead of god's true plan for themselves yeah but we were all raised by people with struggles and issues themselves in most cases they did the best that their upbringing would allow them to do. Let me rephrase that. They did the best that their upbringing would allow them to do. So you can't hate on your mama or your daddy. They're doing the best that their upbringing allow them to do. Yeah. That's their upbringing. Ain't no telling what was happening, how, what they went through. You know, they, boomers don't talk about the past you're not supposed to in boomer land because if you talk about the past somebody might think something bad about you and boomers like for people to think the best they are walking highlight reels i know i'm preaching i don't care yeah that's that's and and so the hush hush we grew up thinking that they never went through anything. And the stuff we were going through, we were devils. Because they were so good. And then when you got older, you start finding out, okay, now wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, and then when you find it out, you shocked. And a lot of people, their faith is harmed. Because their faith was in the parent and not in God yeah yeah so a lot of things went on but we were raised this is why you got to give the people that raised you a pass you got to forgive them because they only did what they knew to do yeah they only did what they knew to do. They had that magic eight ball. 
Should I let him? <laughs> That's the best they can do. Because none of us were raised with real instructions. Amen. So they did the best that they could do. So you got to give them passes. Amen. They did the best that their upbringing would allow them to do. God's grace and mercy brought us to truth so that we could be healed and positioned to forgive in spite of the dysfunction we may have experienced. So you were led to this ministry so that you could get truth and be healed and positioned to forgive. There's no, amen, there's no healing without you forgiving. But you got to be positioned to forgive to understand what you're forgiving. Understand that your parents may have made mistakes. But you still need to listen to some of the things they say. Amen. Understand that they may have dropped the ball. But that don't mean they're not your parent and an authority over you. Yeah. And if you want the blessings of God, you have to honor them. Right. Amen. And to try to honor your parent and not really want to honor them is wrong. Because God is not going by the lip service. He's going by your heart. So if your heart is telling on you, you have a problem with God. And your life will not progress if you don't honor your father. That's right. Amen. Amen. So, God's grace and mercy brought you here. Some of y'all thought y'all was coming here because the music was good. Y'all thought y'all was coming here because you thought the truth behind hip hop was going to go forth every Sunday. I don't know what you thought you were coming for. But you're here by God's grace and mercy so truth can heal you. Amen. Heal you. Heal you from what ails you. I'm here so truth can heal me. Amen. Amen. I may be the mouthpiece speaking it, but don't think I can overstep it. It's got to work on me. Amen. Amen. That's why folks become antinomians and all that stuff. Because they don't want the truth to work on them. They preach something that caters to them instead of works on them. Psalms 51 and 5. Behold, David said, I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Meaning I started out the wrong way we all started out the wrong way amen amen yeah that's a dysfunctional family everybody just got a problem things that we heard saw and accepted in our upbringing created our mindset and understanding did you know that? So if it was negative, you have a disposition to want to hear negativity. Yeah. If, if that's what you heard all the time growing up, then you kind of acquiesce to the negativity. Yeah. If you heard positivity all your life, you can do this, you can make it, those kind of things. You don't spend much time around negative people. I know I'm preaching. Yes. But if you heard your mama complaining, you heard complaints, 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 you saw complaints, you saw negativity, then negativity intrigues you and you like to hear bad things. Yeah. Yeah. Because the things we heard, saw, and accepted in our upbringing created our mindset and understanding. It's very hard for some men to follow 
EX Ministries and ABC. Because at some point, your issues will be addressed. And if you're not positioned to hear it and accept it, then you'll walk away from it. Yeah, but your upbringing did that. You know, the, the larger majority probably of our church are former holiness church people, right? Some kind of form, some kind of holiness. Kojic, P-A-W, U-P-C, something. Because it's familiar hearing the truth that's being taught here. Because you heard that in your upbringing. And your mindset and your understanding adheres to that. Because it's familiar. Does that make sense? Yeah. Trauma in our upbringing causes us to lock in on the pain to the point of carrying it. Trauma causes you to lock in on your own pain to the point of carrying it and it affecting us even as adults. So it happened in your upbringing, but it still affects you as an adult because you carried it. You locked in on it your personality was developing in those years in most cases so when you're developing a personality and who you're gonna be and there's negativity and dysfunction around that stuff gets in you to cause you to believe that you can't really be any better and for a lot of people it's in their development yeah we behave childishly and selfishly because of what happened in our childhood you know they say when trauma occurs the age you were when that trauma occurs you'll have behaviors of that age yeah yeah you're a grown man throwing temper tantrums. Yeah. Like a kid in the store that can't get their way. Yeah. I've dealt with grown men just like that. In here. A tantrum. Because they didn't get their way. I'm going to stop it all. That's a childhood behavior. Well, their trauma occurred in their childhood. They didn't address it. And so they keep reverting back to that childish behavior. Yeah. Selfishness. You know, that's a childish behavior. Snatching your choice, taking your football and going home. It's grown men that act like that. Act like that. Mad because you didn't get picked. Yeah, we had that happen. We, we was playing football out there back when we had that team out there. Y'all remember that? I don't know. Some of y'all remember, remember. I know Jeff remember because he had like an NFL injury out there. <laughs> for free. <laughs> Limped off the field. You remember that? But they had a team out there that was playing football, all of that. And one dude was out there, and man, I guess they said, man, dog, dude, we thought you was better than that. You trash. And something they said, he left the church. Oh, took his ball and went home. I don't even remember what they said. I don't think it was that bad. But he left. I mean, left the church. We ain't heard from him since. Yeah. Behaving childishly because that behavior came from some kind of trauma that occurred that he didn't deal with. 1 Corinthians 13 and 11 says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. And I what? So when you're a child, you're supposed to think like a child. But when I became a man, 
I stopped doing all of that. I put away childish things. Yeah. So I don't have to do what I used to do in the sandbox by the swings and the merry-go-round. Bragging about yourself and what you have. And that's childish behavior. Yeah. Remember when you was young? You be just lying. Somebody say, my daddy got a new car. My daddy got four new cars. He let me drive one. And you eight. Eight years old. He let me drive one. I drove to school. It's parked right over there. Where? Right over there. Yeah, you're just lying. But that's childish behavior, right? But some grown folks do that. They will one-up you no matter what you say. You be wishing you went to the moon or something so they can't one-up it. Dude, I rode on the space shuttle. Well, I can't compete with that. I mean, I need to say something because they will one-up anything. I got a raise. I got one too. I got two raises. You don't want to talk to them. Okay. okay. You always... Yeah, but that's childish behavior because trauma occurred that caused them to have to start lying for approval. Can I keep preaching in here? This is going to help you for real. So, we must first start by righting the wrongs and standing in the gap for our parents and guardians that raised us. Amen. Amen. Call your daddy's name out in prayer. Call your mama's name out. Whoever was responsible for raising you and those that should have raised you, their names should be called out. That's how you know you've forgiven them. If you can open up to God and call their names out, then there has been forgiveness. We may have bad memories, but there were good times too. And here's my thing. You in here. You're not dead. You're not under the underpass. You're not bumming money on the street. You're in here. So that warrants something. They did something right. Man, y'all, please hear me. You don't do this, you're going to take it out on your wife. You're going to take it out on your wife. You're going to mess your kids up. And then you're going to see the same dysfunction you experienced in your house. And it'll slowly creep up. A little bit here, a little bit here. Finally, you look at your house and you see the very thing that happened to you. Those same feelings you had growing up, your children will feel that way about you. Because until it's dealt with, it's alive. Until it's killed, it's alive. It don't die on its own. We have to stop carrying disdain for things we cannot change. Can you change your past? then you can't be walking around feeling a way about it if you can't change it. <laughs> I mean, that's a waste of time. You can't change it. So all you can do is sulk, be sullen, or get more angry, more hatred, more disappointment. You're not walking around with those emotions without those emotions getting into what you're doing. Did you hear me? Yeah, you can't walk around with disappointment, hatred, disappoint, anger. You can't walk around with those emotions and they not get into what you're doing. Your wife's going to feel them. Your children's going to feel them. So 
So stop carrying disdain for things we cannot change and go on and accept the past as it was. This was my upbringing, but I'm here. Amen. No matter how I got here, I got here. Now I can do something about it. Now I can change things going forward. Amen. When you get before God and you're that honest, this is, this is the next step right here. This is grown up, grown up man steps right here. Righting the wrongs of others is the first step in healing and deliverance from our past. Righting the wrongs of others. So whatever was done to you, you are the one that makes it right. You don't wait on mama to call you, daddy to call you. I'm sorry, I should have done. No, you don't wait on nothing. You're the writer of the wrong. Right. Because you've matured to a level to be able to handle that. So you got to right the wrongs of others. That's the first step. Your life ain't going nowhere till you do. So start righting the wrongs of others. Make up for what they didn't do. Forgive them and love them for doing whatever was done to bring you here. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I know I'm preaching. We got men, we got grown men in here. Some of them close to 40, maybe in their 40s. Took their father's last name. Changed their name and their whole family's name to honor their father. Yeah. Because they were writing his wrong. I know we got three in here that changed their names. Yeah. And took their dad's name. Mama gave them her name. And that's not biblical. That's right. That's right. So their lives were at a standstill. And they couldn't move forward. But when they did that and brought that kind of healing. Changed everything. Now their lives are better than blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Because they did what God said. Honor thy father and mother. Amen. So you got to right the wrongs of. Look at somebody say right the wrongs of others. Man when you learn how to right folks wrongs. Man. Psalms 51 and 10. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a what? Right a right spirit within me. Now, how do you get before God and ask him to create a clean heart if there's anger and hatred in your heart and unforgiveness in your heart? You got to let that stuff go so he can create a clean heart in you. Yeah. So there'll be nothing between you and God. But if you have a clean heart, man, mm, you're going to think differently. Yeah, right. Amen. <laughs> then he said, renew a right spirit. Make my spirit right, Lord. Because a wrong spirit is messing my life up. Right, when my spirit is wrong. Right, right, Ooh, I hope y'all listening to me. Yeah. Amen. How, however, questionable upbringings are only the cause of failure when a person doesn't accept Jesus Christ. Dysfunction is only a cause of failure to a person that hasn't really accepted Christ. The statistics that show negative results of dysfunctional homes and environments are not applicable to people that truly are made new by the blood of Jesus. We're odd beaters. Look at somebody say, I'm an odd beater. Yeah, we're not failures because of our history. We're odds beaters. We beat bad statistics. That's what we do. Because we are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? If I'm a new creature, everything's new. So old things are what? That includes dysfunction too. It's all passed away. And all things are become new. 
Amen? The beauty of this is that you get word after word and teaching after teaching to help you become new. Sure, your spirit is made brand new and you on your way to heaven. But then God gets in there and starts dealing with your life, dealing with your decisions, dealing with your personality, dealing with your characteristics of who you are. He begins to make those changes so that you can become new, not just spiritually, but naturally. You can reflect him naturally. Jesus was a reflection of God naturally. He was spiritually, but naturally too. Can I keep preaching? We are not just saved from eternal punishment by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but we are also new creations which changes our minds, hearts, and actions. Let me say that again. So we are not just saved from eternal punishment. You are not just saved from hell after you die. You're saved from hell on earth. Yeah. You saved from the hell you used to create. Amen. Some of y'all, no, I'm just playing. Amen. We all was out there and we're saved from that. So it's not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus saving us from hell, eternal punishment, but we're also made new creations. That means that our minds, hearts, and actions change. So when you know you crazy, you go get help. I need to stop being crazy because I'm saved now. That's right. Amen. I got to stop doing this. I got to stop doing that because I'm saved. Right? Anybody stop doing certain things because you're saved now? You can't just do whatever you want to do no more. You don't want to when you're saved. Amen. Romans 8 and 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So what he's saying is if the spirit is in you, you are not a slave to your flesh. You don't operate in the flesh, but you operate in the spirit because the spirit is in you. Amen. But if the spirit's not in you, then you are none of his. (laughs) The count. (laughs) Antinomian beliefs that create the idea that our old man is still in effect after we come to Christ takes away the power of change when accepting Jesus Christ. So the antinomian belief basically says your spirit is saved, but your actions don't have to reflect it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, you know, Gnosticism. That's what it is. It's Gnosticism, but it's the, it's the doctrine for celebrities. And I've had so many of them just... Oh my goodness. As of late, I mean falling into this because this allows them to live the way they want to live and still claim salvation because they believe their spirit is saved. Yeah, but that takes away the power of change. And that only means change is going to happen when you die. But there's no change while you live. Second Timothy 3 and 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Power of what? The power to change. And these same folks crazy. They believe in miracles. They believe in folks getting healing. Miracles. Isn't that a change? They believe God hears them when they pray. So you're not praying against your homosexual thoughts? If you believe he hears you? Is he pleased with that thinking? 
Well, no, they say no, but he knows that those are the things that our flesh desire. Them things that your flesh desire, bro. Amen. <laughs> he said, I think he said, sin is just, it's an inappropriate response to a legitimate need. He said that that's what sin is. An inappropriate <laughs> to, a to a legitimate need. There's one last thing that'll make some of you uncomfortable. You'll never really know that you're free from sin. Do you actually know that you're free to sin and still be loved by God and redeemed by Christ? For where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You can't out sin God's grace. The more you sin, the more there's grace. Some of y'all say, well, now you just giving people license to sin. Y'all sinning without license. You didn't take no class and get ordained to sin. Sin is just an inappropriate response to a legitimate need. Yeah, that's not the definition of sin. Sin is missing God's mark. You. Sin is missing God's standard. They believe that our spirit is changed, but our flesh should still fulfill lustful desires instead of what the spirit is saying yeah but romans 8 13 says for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die now who wants to die nobody so why would you live after the flesh if the word tells you you're gonna die but if ye through the spirit do kill the flesh and what the flesh wants to do that's what mortify the deeds means. It means not giving your flesh what it's asking for. Your flesh is Judas. You don't give Judas what he's asking for because it's a setup for betrayal. Your flesh will betray you. It'll make you think it's okay. It'll make you think you'll get away with it and then betray you. So Paul is saying, no, through the spirit, you got to mortify the deeds of the body so you can what? Live. Live. So who wants to die? Raise your hand. All those that want to die. Let me rephrase the question. All those that want to live, raise your hand. Definitely a better response. So why are you an advocate for folks dying? That's what an antinomian is. You're an advocate for the flesh. And the Bible says if you live after it, you're going to die. No, I'm an advocate for the spirit because I'd like to continue this journey. Amen. Let me get him off this. Paul raised the question. How can you be dead to who you once were? And still obey the dead man. Because if it's dead, it shouldn't be talking. You're definitely not going to obey something that's dead. That means it really is Count Chocula. <laughs> it's a vampire. I'm not listening to nothing that's dead. He asked it like this in Romans 6 and 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So how can you live in sin if you're dead to it? He says, should we continue in sin? Because we know grace has a bound? God forbid. How can you if you're dead to it? Why did he say that? Because he told you to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Kill them all. Look at somebody and say, kill your flesh. Kill, flesh. kill them all. 
Amen. Not the easiest thing to do, but you have to do it. And you got to monitor it and you got to keep doing it. Flesh will wake up. It'll get rigor mortis and go to move. <laughs> they say folks in the mortuary, when well, they have them on them tables, sometimes they just get up. That's why I can't be no mortician. I'd be shooting and everything. He was already dead. Well, he moved. He got up. Yeah. Yeah. So, he said, how can you do it? You got to keep killing your flesh. Then when you know you've killed it, you're going to have to kill it again. Amen. You know why? Because you're in it. <laughs> you're in the flesh. In the body. The, the human body. So you got to keep killing it. I've been delivered from cigarettes for 20 years. And all of a sudden I got the nicotine taste. You got to kill it again. I ain't smoked weed in 10 days. <laughs> then you still a weed here. Tech Technically, <laughs> that ain't long enough, bro. <laughs> Ten days. <laughs> My God. <laughs> I need a little more distance in that. But yeah, but you're going to have to keep killing the flesh. You got to keep killing it. Amen? Jesus Christ saved us from eternal punishment. And gives us abundant life here and now. Amen. This is to end the dysfunction that we experience so that our children can grow up without the issues that we have. Yeah. So he saved us from eternal punishment, but he also gives us abundant life. Not just eternal life, but abundant life John 10 and 10 the thief cometh not but for to steal to kill and to destroy but I have come that you might have life and that they might have it how? more abundantly more abundantly in other words Christ laying down his life for us created the opportunity for us to lay down our lives for our loved ones. Amen? We stop carelessly sinning and obeying the wants of the flesh so that we can stop dysfunction and give our families a better way to live. Sin is what birthed dysfunction. So why would you try to be a sinner in Christ? If you're a new creation, you should be fighting against sin because it was sin that birthed you into dysfunction. So why would you play with that to add dysfunction to your life and your children and your wife's life? You can't do it. You, gotta, you, you can't do it. You can't carelessly keep sinning and obeying the wants of the flesh. You stop doing that so you can stop dysfunction. Amen? And it has to stop with you. And if you focused on the past and still mad about, angry about what happened in your upbringing, you're going to bring that same spirit in your home because you haven't forgiven you haven't let it go. So it's still alive. John 15 and 13. Greater love hath no man than this. Than a man would lay down his life for his friends. You lay down your life. So we're not promoting the flesh. We're promoting death to the flesh. Laying down what we want or what our flesh wants to do. For what God wants us to to do and don't you want to be better yes, don't you want to be better yes, now you forgive your parent you forgive your father you forgive your upper you forgive them but then you still want to do things better than they did yes, 
And if they love you, they want you to. That's right. That's right. Amen. It's not just about being saved after death, but it's about being saved now. Yeah, it's not just about being saved from hell. It's about being saved now. Saved from the dysfunction that sin brings. Saved from obeying the flesh and being full of pride and selfish ambitions. Saved from making bad decisions instead of prudent ones considering the future salvation brings eternal life and that is for our entire life eternal is eternal so eternal isn't doesn't have a beginning or an end eternal is eternal it's all encompassing of time time is inside eternity just a little portion of it so if it's eternal life then it's life from your beginning God wants to through Jesus' death correct your beginning <laughs> oh I wish you could understand that yeah salvation brings eternal life and that is for our entire life redeeming the past the present and future <laughs> Romans 6 and 20 for when ye were the servants of sin ye were free from righteousness what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed for the end of those things is death but now being made what free from sin, free from sin. And become servants to God. Now see, they like to say, antinomians like to say, being free from sin. You don't know if you're free from sin until you first learn you are free to sin. But that's what they say. They take this scripture and twist it. That's why God knew they was, you think God didn't know they were going to try to do that? He knew. There were Gnostics back in his day, in Jesus' day. So they knew. It was back in Paul's day. So Paul knew what they were going to say. He knew they were going to try to twist that. That's why he added the disclaimer. He said, but now being made free from sin and become what? Service to God. So he said become servants to God. So, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto what? What is holiness? God being God-like. Yeah. Obeying God's rules. That's holiness. Yeah. Ain't no way around this scripture, Elder. It's just no way. Paul didn't leave no room for the foolishness they teach it. So ultimately they just say, well, these were, this was Paul's opinion. You know, they always go there. But yeah, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end of that is what? Everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's it. I want you to understand what we believe in here. And this is, this is it. That's it. We believe in sanctification, holiness, trying our best to live up to the standard that God has set. Amen. Amen. But in order to do that, you got to clean your heart. You got to have a clean heart. Father issues, mother issues, family, upbringing, all those things, they will live in your heart and they will dis disassemble your life piece by piece if you don't deal with it. So I implore you brothers, make sure your heart is clean. Yes, 